Welcome to Twin Peaks Unwrapped. I'm your host, Ben Durant, and beside me is... Brian Kazaska, and we have a very special guest today, Ben. I'll let you introduce him. The godfather of Twin Peaks. The legend, John Thorne, the author of the Essential Wrapped in Plastic Pathways to Twin Peaks book. Welcome, John. Hey, guys. It's good to talk to you. Yeah, so here's something different that we're doing. The show is called Wrapped in Plastic Archives, Frank Silva. You got to give us some background about what, what all this is about. Yeah, I'm happy to. I've been cleaning out my files of all my old Wrapped in Plastic interviews and papers and audio tapes. And I've had the audio tapes of many of the interviews, of all the interviews we did for Wrapped in Plastic. And some of them, I think, are pretty unique, including perhaps uh, one of the best interviews we ever did, which was with uh, Frank Silva, who was mm-hmm. the actor who played Bob in Twin Peaks. And so I managed to digitize it and send it off to you guys. And I thought it might be of interest to the fans out there for them to hear some of the actual interview we did with Frank Silva. I, you know, I did republish the interview in my book. It was originally published in Wrapped in Plastic number eight, way back in 1993. I had it and I thought, you know, I'm just sitting here and the only people who ever listened to it are Craig and me. Sadly, Craig is gone and Frank Silva is gone. And so Mm -hmm. I'm the only one left of that trio where we were sitting with him interviewing him. I just wanted to share some of it with the Twin Peaks fans out there. We're not going to listen to the whole interview. We're going to listen to parts of it. I want to be respectful uh, to both Craig and and Frank Silva, both of whom are gone. Uh, I, I don't want to, you know, I, I didn't want to exploit the whole thing and, 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 you know, use it all. But I I did think it was of interest, of historical interest to them. I think it's, it would honor them. I think that to, to them to, to hear their voices and 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 see, you know, what Craig did to, to put this this interview together, his part in it, and to have Frank's voice. I mean, I, he, Frank is such a charming guy, and you know, you don't yeah. always you don't get that because you always think, oh, Bob's evil, and you don't get to really know about this guy. And and he hasn't done many interviews, so to have his moment to get to know a little bit more about Frank is. Is pretty special. Yeah, I think so. I think that's very true. In fact, that was one of the most surprising things uh, about meeting him was, uh, you know, how how much different he was, obviously, than Bob. But I mean, just his whole demeanor was different than Bob. I'll set up how this all came to be. Craig and I, we were at the Twin Peaks Festival in 1993 in Snoqualmie and Issaquah in Washington State. Uh, this was the first fan run Twin Peaks Festival. The one that there was one in 92, but it was it was um, hosted by New Line Cinema. And it was really a promotional mm-hmm. event for the release of Fire Walk with Me. But this one was you know run entirely by fans. So we we went to this and you know, the first day we were there, we met Catherine Colson and Al Strobel was there and Jan Darcy was there. And Frank Silva was supposed to be there, but he hadn't shown up. And so everyone had their fingers crossed, you know, is Frank Silva going to be there? I'll just share this story real quick. Craig and I were at the banquet. There's this banquet that they have. Uh, Back then they had it on Friday night and we were allowed to sit up with the actors, you know, up up on the the stage, so to speak. So I was sitting up there and I was facing the crowd and everybody was sitting at the tables and they were all looking up at the people who were, you know, basically up in the front. And the entrance to the banquet hall was in the back. I was sitting there and we were all kind of chatting and everyone was talking and I looked up and I saw Frank Silva walk in the door. It was the first time I'd ever seen him. Now, I have vivid imagery of Bob. <laughs> and Twin Peaks was very, very recent. And he walked in the door. And I, I got to say, my heart probably skipped a beat because he, there he was. He, you know, mm-hmm. was like, wow, that is him. And then he came up and spoke for quite a while at the banquet and answered questions from the crowd. I was about six or seven feet from him watching him talk. And at one point, he, um, he did the Bob you know, growl and and howl. It literally sent a shiver down uh, my my back. It was just 
astounding to see him perform that. And I think some of that's on YouTube. Somebody recorded that. It was in the banquet hall. So if people want to go and look, you can see him answering the question. So Craig and I, we asked him if he would, we were thinking we would do a phone interview. We did it phone interviews with Al Strobel and phone interviews with Catherine Colson. We assumed we would perhaps do that with him. And he said, why don't we sit down and talk? Why don't we do it right here? And so we were kind of amazed. And and so he said, let's do it tomorrow, Saturday. And so Saturday came along and we went into a, a little meeting room in the hotel and it was just Frank Silva, Craig and me. We spoke with him for over an hour, just the three of us, and really kind of dug deep into Twin Peaks and Firewalk with me. And he was the most generous guy. He was so pleasant to be around, very gentle, great sense of humor, just thrilled, I think, that that he was part of this whole scene. You know, he kind of been vaulted into celebrity status from this role on Twin Peaks. It was just a great experience. And I, I'll never forget it. It's just very sad that Frank Silva died only a couple of years later because I think mm. he... Um, he would have been a great ambassador, I think, from the show, just like Catherine Coulson was, just like Charlotte Stewart is. He loved working with Lynch. He loved working on Twin Peaks. And he was, as I, as I said, um, just a very gentle, uh, pleasant man. And so anyway, you'll hear some of, of it shortly. Yeah, you interviewed him in August of uh, 1993. And I think he said something like, oh, we'll have to meet up again, maybe at another festival or something. But September uh, 13th, 1995, he, he had passed away. Yeah. yeah, we went to the festival in 94. I think Michael J. Anderson was a guest there, which was fantastic because we hadn't met him yet. And Catherine Colson was there. As I recall, Josh Eisenstadt, who of course is the big, big Twin Peaks fan, was, was there. And he said, Frank Silva is nearby. He's coming. And we all thought he was going to mm. come. And, and um, there was a lot of buzz that he was going to show up. He, he never did that year. And, mm. and I don't know if it's because he was sick. I don't, I don't know the reason. I don't want to spread any rumors or anything. I don't know why he didn't show up, but there was an expectation he would, and he, he did not. And so, mm. yeah, that was the only festival he appeared was at that 93 festival. And one of the few times that he met the fans and, you know, did these interviews. Do you want to set up the first clip? Uh, sure. So, okay. I, you know, just to set the scene. So it's Craig and me in this little room. Frank Silva is smoking like a chimney. <laughs> He's smoking a lot. <laughs> we spent the first 15 minutes or so talking to him about his relationship with a professional relationship with working with Lynch, how he came to be there, how, you know, uh, as a uh, prop master, what he, his responsibilities were behind the scenes on A Wild at Heart and Cowboy and the Frenchman and blah, blah, blah. And then- and That's probably in your book too, right? I mean, that was probably- oh, yeah, the entire transcript, the entire interview is, is in the book. But then after, you know, some time and we kind of got all that out of the way, we asked him, you know, the question, which was, we, we all know the, the story of, of Bob was sort of an accident and- uh, you know, how was it that, uh, can you tell us how it was for you that Bob came to be? But it was, you know, it was an accident, but I really had no idea, even though it was an accident, and that's kind of where it kind of started. Mm-hmm. I didn't think that it would go anywhere. I thought, oh, well, you know how big it is. <laughs> right? This could be just, uh, you know, a spur of the moment kind of thing. And we never ever thought, or at least I did, but I don't even know if we did, that it would lead to what it actually led up to. Sure. You know, I thought, oh, it's not going to make it into the film. I'm not going to be, you know, into the series or anything. It's just going to be per chance mm-hmm. kind of thing. And when we actually did that, that, that ending mm-hmm. of Bob being a reality and being shot by the one-armed man, mm-hmm. Even then, at that point, when I, we actually did an entire huge scene with Bob, I thought, this isn't really going to go anywhere. Mm-hmm. It could possibly be the ending <laughs> to this movie, mm-hmm. and it could possibly not be the ending to this movie. Um, apparently, it was the ending in the European version. Right. Um, but also, at that point, I never thought, that they'd be calling me for series. I thought, oh, this is just a joke. And then all of a sudden they'd call and say, David wants you here at the set. And I'd say, well, what for? And they'd, we don't know. We <laughs> just want you here. <laughs> and they'd go, don't forget, bring your clothes. Because, <laughs> you know, the Bob wardrobe is what I was wearing to work that day. 
And he hasn't changed since. <laughs> so the yeah. denim jacket is yours? Yeah, yeah, that's where it all came. You know, I'm like, <laughs> this is my wardrobe. They say, bring you, these are Bob shoes. These are mm -hmm. my Bob boots. <laughs> that's great. You know, so they, they would all say, oh, don't forget, bring your, bring your clothes. <laughs> so I'd go in and there would never be anything scripted for Bob in the script. Mm -hmm. You know, so I'd go in and I'd sit there and I'd wait and I'd wait and I'd wait. You know, and then David, they'd get ready, they'd start getting lighting for the scene that I was going to do. Mm -hmm. But no one ever told me what I was going to do. Okay. And David never told me what I was going to do. Then at the last minute, David would go, well, I want you to do this, this, and this. And sometimes he wouldn't even say, I want you to do this. He'd like, well, it would be generalizing, like the scene with, um, the the scene with Maddie and Donna and James singing yeah. yeah yeah that's a real that's powerful, powerful scene. I know I mean, David would go well Frank I think I want Frank to like walk into the room and maybe uh, leap over the sofa <laughs> and that was it <laughs> and he and, and he'd tell the cameraman and so they'd light it and so then they'd get they'd done lighting it and and they go okay we need first scene and that's you know first team on the set. Okay. So I was like standing there and David walked up to me in the dining room of the, of the Hayward house and go, Frank just walk in and blah, 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 blah. And he'd walk away and go, you know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> and I went, I would turn around and go, I know what to do. <laughs> yeah, you know what to do. And he'd go, okay, action. And Instead of leaping, I just didn't feel comfortable leaping, so that's how I just crawled over it. Yeah. And as I started crawling over it and got over the sofa, David said, keep crawling. <laughs> and so I kept crawling, and he didn't say anything. He didn't say stop. He didn't say <laughs> cut. So he, I kept crawling, and I kept crawling. But I was always taught that you're not supposed to, like, look at the camera or look at the lens of the camera and all right. this other because I've been told or been around films enough. Sure. So I crawled and I kept crawling to the camera and I never heard David say cut. So I crawled to the side of the camera <laughs> and just the long side of the camera and David said cut. <laughs> and I kind of goes, that was great, right? <laughs> Do it again. So crawl right into the camera. And I went, okay. So that, we did it in two days. Incredible. Crawled right into the camera. So you're responsible really for a lot of, of that Bob and the... I guess the intensity, I guess the intensity... But see, and that's the thing, I really didn't know what Bob really was. None of us really did, and I didn't even think David did. I mean, I certainly at first thought he was real. Mm -hmm. And who knows, he still could be. Right. And he could still be reality. But I just thought he was this really whacked out, crazy guy. You know, <laughs> intense, crazy guy. You know, so it was never really, David and I never really sat down and discussed this character. Mm -hmm. Or discussed the characterization. He just said, you know, he would like saying, well, you know what to do. When we were doing the murder scene in the train car for that dream sequence, he would just say, get down into that mound of dirt and play with the mound of dirt. Then he'd say, okay, now walk towards the camera and that screen. Mm. And, you know, it was just, it basically just kind of just, this character just kind of grew. Such a great voice. He's such a great <laughs> storyteller. He is. You know? Yeah, it's great to hear that again. It struck us at the time, wow, you know, you know David Lynch just sort of knew what, Frank Silva was going to bring to the scene and there was this sort of building it in the moment kind of effort, I guess, you know, he just sort of let it flow. And so that scene, which is one of the greatest scenes of Twin Peaks when Bob crawls over the couch, yeah. I mean, it's great. It just sort of happened that way. It's interesting too, to hear him talk about, you know, the clothes, the clothes that he was wearing the day they saw him, you know, on the set and said, we're going to use Bob. And you know, that reminded me as I heard that again, I'd forgotten it reminded me when we were up there, Al Strobel was there and he was driving that that little Chinook camper van, camper, yeah. you know, that's in Fire Walk With Me. That was his actual vehicle. That was Al Strobel's vehicle. And I remember talking to him about that. And, and originally they were going to have him in some big 1950s sedan that was going to be, you know, the one our man's 
car. I think Al Strobel said to David Lynch, why don't I just drive my Chinook? David Lynch was like, okay, yeah, do that. And so you know, the fact that Bob is dressed in the clothes he was wearing and Al Strobel is driving the car he drove around in right. in his everyday life, it all became part of the Twin Peaks mythology. Right. And mm-hmm. I think that's part of the beauty of Twin Peaks is right. just how it was, it fell into place and it was just right. I think I asked Sharon Fenn and she's always said, oh yeah, she wore her own clothing. Like, at least especially on the series, she was like, I wasn't going to wear it. I was going to wear baggy sweaters. I was going to wear my own clothing. <laughs> yeah. You so. know, it, it's really interesting. It's just really interesting how Lynch found the comfort zone, I think, of some of these actors probably ended up getting something much, much stronger on film than maybe if they had tried to artificially go in there and construct it. So mm-hmm. that's why I think some some of what the intensity of Bob is Frank Silva, he and Lynch together, but, but perhaps more Silva than Lynch, you know, he's the one who, who made Bob what he was. You have a picture uh, for issue eight of Wrapped in Plastic with Frank Silva wearing glasses, sunglasses and stuff. Yeah. I, I imagine you telling me the story. He walks into the festival and he probably has his shades. And I look at the shades and I think, movie stars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, it's funny. My wife took that picture and ah. it's, it's floating around on the internet. You know, yeah, Craig liked that and he chose that to make it the cover of issue eight. It is kind oh. of an odd picture because it's not Bob because he's wearing right. those sunglasses. It's really right. Frank Silva. It is. Um, but he, yeah, he was wearing those glasses all weekend, and they're big cool. sunglasses. Yeah. So, um, maybe yeah, he doesn't like was, the sun. Maybe he doesn't like the light. Maybe he's sensitive to the light. I don't I, know. Yeah, yeah. I don't Hollywood know. Bob. Uh, Hollywood Bob. <laughs> oh yeah, Bob. yeah, yeah. So, and there are also pictures out there of you and Craig at that table, like you were saying. And it was because you guys had done wrapped in plastic, or in the you were working on wrapped in plastic, that you got the honor of sitting right next to uh, Frank Silva. <laughs> I think so. I mean, you know, you got to remember the time. This was like a year after Firewalk with Me, yeah. which essentially had bombed. You know, I mean, in terms of the larger public mind, Twin Peaks was gone. There was only a core group of people who were mm-hmm. still passionate about it. And so the show had been off for two years and the film, right? The show went off in 91. And right. so, you know, we had started wrapped in plastic. We were only like five or six issues in. When, and we, whoever was hosting, it was Pat Shook, I think, was the, um, yeah, Pat Cokewell was the owner of the Double R. Pat Shook was the person who was organizing this festival. And mm. she wanted to get the word out, and Wrapped the Plastic was there. And so it was all real fan okay. generated. And yeah. she was kind enough, you know, essentially invite us to sit up at the banquet table, which was, which was really, uh, you know, a very nice honor to be there. Mm. And, you know, at the time, I'm just a young guy who like, loves my show, right? I'm not a big Twin Peaks fan. Here I am kind of, for me, it was like Hollywood, right? Like, right. oh my gosh, I'm sitting up here yeah. next to Al Strobel. And, and, uh, and I, I met Catherine Coulson that day. And it was just, yeah. you know, astounding. Um, and and I, I hope that feeling has, you know, dissipated in me. I still, you know, I'm just amazed to have been able to meet and, and been in contact with these great, great people. Keep going back to that when we did do that dream sequence in the train car. Um, that was a pretty powerful scene when we filmed it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And when we did that, Bob to me was still, I thought, a reality. Mm-hmm. Before I did that, I turned to Cheryl Lee and I just basically told her, I said, look, we're going into the playpen. Let's just pretend that this is playtime now and this is not reality. And like I was talking, at the at the meeting i basically there was a point when i was playing that scene where the reality for me that bob i thought was a reality and that the intenseness of his character the intensity of being a wacko crazy guy who has killed someone to him to him it was almost as if it was a sexual act the killing was having sex and to me I was feeling, as I was doing that scene, that after the killing was over and the screams were happening, because the screams happened after the killing, right. not so much during the killing, right. but after the killing. What I was picking up on, and myself, was the screams of terror, but also of sorrow, mm-hmm. 
almost like a release. And some of the some of those screams in that cut, in, in not in the, the maybe the stuff that visually got saw, but a, a lot of those screams ended in screams of crying to me. Yeah, it was almost yeah. screaming as a release to let the tears flow of remorse after what had just happened. And I don't know if David picked up on that, which I have a feeling he did, and he saw something there, that, wait a minute, that he did see, like, maybe someone else, or Bob was someone else, sure. or someone else was Bob. This was the remorsefulness coming out. Mm -hmm. And maybe he clicked that together and kind of bled, rather than Bob just being one, that maybe he was two, maybe he was three, or he was the entity that possessed people. Oh, so good. Yeah, it's interesting to see it from his point of view, and of course, you know, what he was bringing to the performance. Obviously, there's, there's debate about when Lynch and Frost decided you know, that they were going to make Leland the killer, you know, again, it's part of that whole organic, organic aspect of storytelling of, you know, if Leland was the killer, then what was Bob and, and how does Bob factor into that? And does Bob exist or is Bob a mask? And so anyway, it's interesting to hear him talk about, you know, what is the reality of Bob from his point of view, playing this character? Because he's trying to find some point of origin to or groundedness to what it is that he's playing. Every great bad guy has some kind of humane part of him. Like, I even think like Darth Vader, there's like, <laughs> he cares about his son. You know what I mean? Like, maybe he was going for that, too. That like, maybe he was a ruthless, animalistic uh <laughs> you know being but there's still part of him that like maybe didn't like that he <laughs> destroyed people i don't know well i think i think that's very true i think for him playing bob was difficult um and i think we may have something i don't know if we have some of that later where he talks about not wanting to watch it when we think about twin peaks now bob is sort of the embodiment of evil and right. bob isn't necessarily you know, anything redeemable or anything human, he is perhaps the evil that men do. And and so as an actor playing that, that's got to be kind of hard. And he he probably was trying to find something more to it. But ultimately, Bob is this, you know, sort of force of evil who is memorable because of that Silva performance. You want to go to the next clip about uh, killing Maddie? Yeah. So, you know, he was talking about in the previous clip, he's talking about the scene where he's killing Laura for the um, second season. I think it's the second season premiere, right, where we yep. see the death of Laura, which was difficult for them to shoot. And he's talking there about how difficult that was. But, you know, poor Frank Silva and poor Cheryl Lee, they have to do this scene essentially over and over again. So yeah. those two actors come back to do the death of Maddie Ferguson. Uh, and then of course, they're gonna come back and do the death of Laura again for Fire or Walk With Me. But I think of those three scenes, probably the death of Maddie is the toughest scene in, in, in so, on so many levels. I think it's the hardest scene of, of them all to watch. I really yeah. do. I think that's a I really agree. tough scene to watch. It's hard to believe it was on network TV in 1990. It's the kind of thing that, you know, you'd see on HBO now. And even then you'd be like, wow, they went, they went kind of far. Yeah. <laughs> it's also just an interesting aside. Um, if you look at the original script of that episode where Bob's going to kill Maddie, the scene in the script is described. I think Maddie comes down the stairs and Bob turns and sees her and then it cuts away. And they never scripted it. They never detailed it. This was all Lynch putting this murder scene together. And so here we asked him about what that scene was like and, and how, how it was to make it. And, you know, what direction did he get from David Lynch in, in how to perform it? There was a lot of sexual stuff that was wrong between Bob mm -hmm. and her. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the, the, the part of that killing scene is dancing with her. Yeah. It's the slow dancing with her in the, yeah. in the even the super slow motion. Right. And when we were doing that, David, his only direction was dreamy. I want it dreamy. Make it dreamy. And that was what he wanted in that scene. He wanted it dreamy and sexual and really slow and almost, as I take it, 
animalistic. I mean, because that's mm -hmm. how he, that's how he sends Bob anyway. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, is he's more animal than anything. You know, so I played him more like an animal. You mm -hmm. know, I got I wanted that feeling to him, but that was like the big thing for the dance thing. He kept saying dreamy for all of us, for mm -hmm. when Leland did it, for when I did it, for when Ben Horn did it. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, but that scene was so horrific to do. Because I remember when we did the master of me doing it, I was so exhausted towards the end of the scene because we shot it all in one sequence, the master. Okay. Mm -hmm. And at the end where I shove her head into Missoula, Montana. Missoula, Montana. I, mean. <laughs> I, I fucked up the line too. But so when I <laughs> shove her head into that, Right. I was so exhausted. We were both so exhausted. She falls to the floor. Right. I was so exhausted and so into it. I fell to the floor with her in mm -hmm. exhaustion over her body. Mm -hmm. And it ended with me kind of animalistic over the body, kind of licking the body mm -hmm. right. um, and hovering over the body. It was such an intense thing to do. And poor Cheryl Lee. She still had to do it two more times yeah. after that. And, and... Close-up. Yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> coverage. We had to do coverage on it. And she had to do everything. We had breaks, you know, taking turns, but she was like mince me. Wow. It's <laughs> yeah. It's tough yeah. stuff. Yeah, it had to be tough to do. And but and you know, we all know, you know, we well, we all know I, I say this, but I think most you know, fans know that and Cheryl Lee has talked about doing that uh, scene. We interviewed Cheryl Lee, I guess it was a couple of years later, and we talked to her about that scene. And she, I'm sure she talked about it a number of times, but just about how hard it was. I think she says she went to bed that night and she literally fell out of bed the next, she couldn't get up. She was so tired from that intensity of that scene. You know, there was a little bit more to that clip, which, you know, it's, it's not really important, but he, he does mention, you know, I did it and Leland you know, Ray Wise does it and Ben Horn does it and Richard Beamer. The three of them each had to do it. But Cheryl Lee had to do it with them each time. And it was it was really, really an intense scene. Quick note, I don't remember this was in ninety-three, and I don't remember if when he said Ben Horn did it, I don't remember if we knew or we had just found out that they got Richard Beamer to do the scene as well. It was all part of you know, a scam, essentially. They didn't want the the true identity of Bob to leak to the press. You know, there were people, you know, there was no internet then, but there were still people who were trying to, you know, get tidbits about secrets of Twin Peaks. And they were afraid that if um, they shot that scene with just Ray Wise and Frank Silva, that the news would get out that Ray Wise was the killer. And so they shot it with Richard Beamer as well. And of course, there is a plot point an actual plot point where they do believe Ben Horn is the killer and so in order to confuse things among the uh, the the crew members who are there they actually shot that scene they were never going to use it with Richard Beamer and of course that was all just sort of to dupe people into not knowing with Twin Peaks though I mean you would think well maybe all three of them right? you know did it who right. knows right <laughs> so uh yeah. so but that it, but I remember him saying Ben Horn he says Ben Horn he doesn't say Richard Beamer and I remember either we had just found that out or that was a new piece of information that was kind of a big revelation at the time maybe we had the scripts by then and we had seen that it had been scripted not as Leland, but as Ben. If you have the script to that episode, um, it's scripted as Ben Horn throughout, even though somehow Ben Horn is in the Palmer household. It doesn't make any yeah. sense that he would be there. <laughs> but, um, yeah. but anyway, we're going off on a tangent, but I, just remembering these revelations as we learned them, as we were kind of digging into the making of Twin Peaks and how it was done. Some of these things at the time were really, really stunning and fascinating to find out about. Ben, we, we asked Richard, uh, Beamer. Richard Beamer about that. And I can't remember what he said, if he said he couldn't remember or something. Well, the interesting I think with, with him was that he did say he was the first one to go. I think he did the blocking, the yes. first blocking. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. I don't know what, what it would have been him, then Frank, and then Ray Wise. I don't know, but. Yeah, that is true, though. I think Lynch took advantage of this situation. Obviously, it was all for, you know, just again to to fool people. But he used it as a blocking 
uh, exercise as well. So he kind of knew how the lighting and the cameras were going to go yeah. with Richard Beamer. Now you remind me, Richard Beamer went first so that when they got to Frank Silva and Ray Wise, they were a little more ready for it to be what it was going to be in the final version. Could there have been footage out there to see uh, Richard uh, Beamer? I don't know. That yeah. would be crazy to see his version of things, but be I'm so sure cool. it's all gone. The next clip, Frank, working with Tim Hunter, director Tim Hunter. Yeah, you know, we were really interested in ask because he he most of the interview and most of, of um, you know, Frank Silva's uh, experience on Twin Peaks was working with David Lynch. But Bob did become kind of a recurring character. Uh, we didn't see a lot of him, but we did see him from time to time through the series. I still, to this day, think Tim Hunter was probably the second best director uh, on the series. And Tim Hunter was an established movie director and, and had, had accomplished, done some, some great work. And so we wanted to ask him about what it was like to work with a different director, Tim Hunter in particular, and how it was different, too, uh, than working with Lynch. I go in with David, and usually... We got it in one take. Whatever I had to do was usually one take, if anything, two. But usually it was there in that first one. It was right on, it was perfect, and lighting was fine, hit the marks, and it seemed to be the right intensity. Maybe two. Now with Tim, I went in with Tim, and I was used to already playing Bob right. for a while. Mm -hmm. So I kind of had an idea of what I thought Bob was. Mm -hmm. So he would say, um, let's try it. And I, I do my my Bob my Bob thing, right. and then he go, well, Frank, let's do something with the hands. Let's do something yeah. with the hands. Let's do something strange or weird with the hands. <laughs> so I, of course, okay. <laughs> so I would like do my Bob thing and then do what he wanted, something weird with the hands. <laughs> and then he'd go, Frank, you're right. Don't do the hands. <laughs> <laughs> You know, what's great about that is it just confirms what we were saying earlier is that, you know, Frank Silva is is Bob. I mean, he, he knew how to play Bob. And even yeah. when he's collaborating with another great director like Tim Hunter, you know, Tim Hunter's got an idea what Bob should be and maybe how Bob should perform. And he directs Frank Silva to do that. And Frank's kind of like, well, that's not how I do Bob, but I'll do it. And then, you know, Tim Hunter's <laughs> like, well, oh, you know what? You're right. So yeah. Don't get in Frank Silva's way. We'll just let him do Bob. Again, it just goes to show how Lynch's instincts on finding a performer. It's just amazing. No one else could have played Bob. And I do remember when all the rumors were starting and we, we knew there was going to be a new Twin Peaks. We knew Twin Peaks The Return was coming. We didn't know what it was called. And the question was, at least on my mind, and I may have even talked to you guys about it, is what are they going to do with some of the actors who have passed away? You know, yeah. now they've recast in the past. They recast, obviously, the biggest uh, recasting was for Lara Flynn Boyle's Donna. They didn't have Lara Flynn Boyle for Fire Walk With Me. So they, they've done recasting. I thought, well, they might recast Bob. And I was a little worried about that. I really, truly was. Like, you know, I don't know how you recast Bob, but I guess you could say, you know, in the 25 years, something's happened to him. He's changed. He's a different kind of being than he was <laughs> before. And but they didn't do that. They they reused footage of Frank Silva from the original works and kept him there. I think that was the right choice. They honor Frank Silva as they do any of the actors who passed away by doing an in memoriam credit for them and giving them credit, you know, in, in any sequence that, that Bob appears, Frank Silva is credited as Bob in the return. So that's that the right way to go. You think of the little man from another place. He became another being. He became a tree or something like that. So they, <laughs> yeah, they, they could have done that, but they, it is amazing how they honored all these Don Davis is a major mm -hmm. Briggs and like, they're yeah. so clever. They're able to keep them somehow still part of the show, part of the return. Yeah, the uh, David Bowie, you David know, Bowie, um, yeah. who, who passed away, you know, very close to the production of The Return. I think David Bowie was supposed to be, hmm. you know, they had intended him to be in The, the Return and um, it didn't happen, but they did not recast. You're right, Don Davis. They did not recast. That was the right way to go. And, yeah. And, and, and yeah, The Little Man from Another Place. I mean, how do you recast that? How do you bring yeah. in, and you know, how do you bring another actor to play that? No, yeah. Lynch is like, no, he's just a tree now. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we're all like, sure. Okay. <laughs> it works. Why not? It works for me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>
talk about you know uh, Tim Hunter and you know let's try some things with your hands, Frank. Um, it made me think about director Gyllenhaal. Is it episode twenty seven? I'm not sure what episodes we're doing, but you have the whole pool of oil and you see the red oh. curtains, and all of a sudden Bob comes out, and sure enough, and the whole episode has people kind of shaking their hands or something. But he does yeah. do some kind of uh, Bob does do some kind of funky thing with his yeah. arm, or maybe it's not even a hand; that it's an arm, yeah. arm gesture. But that's what it just made me think of. It's like, well, another director was able to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a great point. Yeah, and in fact, isn't that unusual? You do think of it; it's, it's memorable because it is different. Yeah, yeah Bob, uh, his arm appears right. It kind of phases through something, yeah. and then it, it was like a, and he does like a wave. It's he does like a wave. Like, yeah. And, the next clip is is really we get a little here about a uh, story about him working on uh, Firewalk with Me, or or maybe not working. On Firewalk with me. <laughs> <laughs> the interesting thing about this is we are in the the location essentially when we're talking we're in Issaquah and Snoqualmie Falls in 1993 he had he had been there as had the other actors uh to film Firewalk with me in the fall of 1991 and so this was just two years previous this is very very fresh yeah and and, and and that you know gets to just sort of another aside here some of these interviews that I have of the actors they are very um fresh in their mind the events of the series or the events of the film um, are only a year a few years in the past for them and so we all know our memories kind of change and fade and and become a little distorted as time mm. goes on it's great to hear some of these fresh memories being relayed and so we asked him about whether or not he had come up to film on location and he kind of has a little funny story about how little he really did up there in the Seattle area. You know, I came up for like three days the first time here in Seattle and they were running so far behind that they never used me. So they sent me back home and then I came back up the last week that they were here and I was on call for the entire week. And every day they'd like put me on call and I'd be at the hotel and they would go, Frank, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I think I'm here to work. He goes, well, I don't know about that. I don't think we're going to ever get to it. <laughs> Every day I'd get that from David. Frank, what are you still doing here? I said, David, I'm here to do that scene. Well, I don't know. I don't think we're going to get to it. Because <laughs> we had planned on doing the killing scene in the, in the train car, in the original train car. Mm -hmm. That was why I was here for that last week. We were going to actually do the murder scene here. Right on. But they, yeah, but they ran out of, they did run out of so much time. In fact, I was here for an entire week. And the only thing, the last day I was here, the only thing that I shot, you know, when Leland's dumping the body in the river, mm -hmm. right. and he walk, walk away, yeah. turn and walk away, that's it. Wow. That's what I came here for. For like nine days. That was it. And they said, well, we're, we're going to do the killing scene in L.A. We're going to build it on the set. Mm -hmm. You know, so basically that, and in fact, that was our last day of shooting was the killing scene, the train car scene, mm -hmm. Halloween. <laughs> really? My birthday. Yeah. That's crazy. A couple of interesting things there. So, yeah. So just in case anyone didn't quite get what he was talking about, you know, there is that scene in Fire Walk With Me where Leland has put the body in the water and he turns and for a, for a, for a second we see Bob turning. Mm. That was it. That was the entire on location shot for, uh, for Frank Silva, who was up there. Wow. Um, but the other thing I had forgotten about this, this is really interesting. Well, he, he says anyway, that the intention was to film the killing in the, in the original train car. Well, you may remember from the pilot, there's a scene where Andy's crying outside of the train car. Mm -hmm. And that train car really was up there in the woods. It wasn't long after that, that it was removed and it was mm -hmm. gone. And I'm not sure the history, there's probably other people out there who know far better. In fact, there's probably some Twin Peaks fans who live in the area who could, who could tell us. So I don't want to get the details wrong, but my recollection is that that train car that, that they shot for the pilot was there in, and they were hoping to use it again. They did not use it. They did build a set, did it all in LA. And, and then subsequent to that, that train car was removed and all of that 
that area was gone. I don't remember if anyone was able to go in 93 to actually visit that site. I did not go. I went to see a lot of the other filming sites, many of which now long, no longer exist, like the mm. Packard Sawmill and the Fat Trout Trailer Park. All of those things are gone. Yeah. And I don't know if by then the train car was gone too, but uh, I wish it had not been. I wish we could go and visit that, that oh, filming cool. site. It'd be a great place to go see. I don't recognize that person up there. Because to me, it's not me. So I don't recognize him. Now I can I can sit and watch it. During the series, I had a rough time hmm. watching it. It really disturbed me. And it still disturbs me when I see it, but I also, I know that that's not me. So sure. it's like, it's weird, it's different. And it's kind of spooky. So I think any actor, no matter who they are, I mean, I think that would be really like the roughest thing possible, is yeah. to sit and, and Watch yourself on a big sure. screen yeah. objectively. I think that's pretty scary. And I don't know how they do it. Another thing that I never did either as Bob, as the character of Bob when I was on the set, is when I went into the makeup trailer and whenever I would get near a mirror, I wouldn't look at myself. Yeah. I yeah. couldn't, I couldn't, even those mirror scenes, right. those were the most horrific scenes for me to do would play those scenes looking at myself oh, yeah. mirror, and doing those whole things yeah. was really bizarre. And another thing, doing Fire Walk With Me, that scene where I turned into Maddie in the train car looking in the right. mirror, when I did that scene, I went off into another plane. Something happened. Mm. Something happened when I looked into the mirror and did that scene, and David yelled, cut. And I walked away, and David said, Frank, Frank, come here, you got to see this. And I said, what? And they go, come here, you just got to see this. And David had froze that scene on the monitor. I said, David, I don't want to look at that. I said, I was in some strange place. And he goes, <laughs> I picked up on that too. There was something happening that he saw, and I said, I don't want to see it because I was somewhere where I don't want to be again yeah. hmm. during some of those things. Hmm. It was a little weird. He accidentally mentioned saying when he turns into Maddie, he meant to say, when it turns into Laura in the scene in Fire Walk With Me, the mirror, it's the scene we all, you know, I'm sure remember there's a mirror that- I always thought you knew it was me. Yeah, and Laura's looking into it, and then there's a, a brief sequence, I think, where we see um, Bob. It, it's interesting to hear him. He, he's, he's very grounded and serious about it. I mean, he he, he recognized, I think, the kind of, of character he was playing and it, it was it was a really tr troubling character it, it really was it reminds me of frank booth in blue velvet with Den dennis hopper i uh, happened to, to be able to see dennis hopper briefly do a q a um, and talk about playing this character who was beyond redemption in blue velvet mm. um there there's you know, all the humanity is leached out of frank booth he, he's he's sort of the precursor to bob Dennis Hopper's agent, I believe, and again, I don't, I don't want to get this wrong, and you know, but as I recall, the agent was against Dennis Hopper taking that role because there was no redemption for that character. There was no real arc, really, for the character. He's just this evil presence who does mm. these terrible, awful things. But um, I think Dennis Hopper understood what it was and, and, and was able to manage divorcing himself from playing this kind of very, very awful being. And I think that comes through when you listen to Frank Silva talk about playing Bob. Frank Silva was just such a nice man. He was so nice. And I think you hear that. I think you can yeah, hear that in his voice. Definitely. Uh, and, and, you know, it Im impacted him playing that. We, you know, I, I think I've told you this story before, and I, I won't belabor it, but, you know, after this interview, I think we had gone so long, we had kept Frank Silva from getting his ride to the next festival event. He was supposed oh. to appear at something. I forget they had, you know, the schedule of events and the actors appeared at various ones. And so we had, unfortunately, we had delayed him because we spent so much time. And so he needed a ride up you know, uh, I-90 to get to wherever we were going. And so my wife and I and Frank Silva got in the car and we drove him up and drove him right past uh, the Double R Diner and, and right through town and right down the road. And he remembered being there for the pilot and the behind the scenes stuff. And he was sharing stories with us in the car. 
And um, it was that was just a really incredible experience to drive around the locations with him and he would point things out. And I know for sure we drove by and at least one person looked up and their jaw kind of dropped open because we were driving Bob <laughs> through past the Double R Diner. Am I right? He was a set dresser, right? So he was actually a, a, back in the in the series. He was a crew member, right? I mean, well, for the pilot, he was. Yeah. And he was responsible for dressing the sets and making sure that the set looked like David Lynch wanted it to look like. So, you know, what would be on a desk, what would be on a table, um, what would be on the walls, things like that. And so that was, yeah, that was his, um, that was his job. Yeah. So I think you're driving past the double R and I'm thinking, Bob never went to the double R. Right. And I'm like, Wait a minute. He, if he was set dresser, he would make sure like, well, you know, what's happening in the double R? Like, how it's- is he going to look? Yeah. Exactly. Any location we went to, if it was in the pilot, he had been there, not mm-hmm. as Bob. In fact, I found some photos. You know, there was a photographer who was um, on location when they were filming out on Bainbridge Island, you know, where the big log is and the body is uh, washed up, they, you know, where they find Laura Palmer's body. And there was a photographer there who was taking behind the scenes shots. And I have a photo. And I'll show it to you guys someday. What hopefully we will see each other in person someday again soon. So. Um, yes. There's this shot of the crew and the camera and the makeup people all kind of down on the beach. Cheryl Lee is, is laying there. I mean, again, it's all very tiny figures. You can't really make everybody out, but you know they're there. You can see Mark Frost. You can see David Lynch. You can see Ron Garcia, who's the director of photography. And you can see Frank Silva standing there. And he's kind of leaning over looking at the body wrapped in plastic. And it is in many ways, one of the eeriest shots because at that point, he's a crew member. He has nothing to do with the story, you know, performing in the story. And yet in this shot, it looks like Bob is there looking at the body and it is, is a strange picture. So, (laughs) so, but, but yeah, he was there on almost, you know, I, I imagine on almost every scene they shot for the pilot frank silva was there so yeah when we were driving him through town he had story he remembered being there and, and, t- and he could tell us things about you know, shooting at night out on the road james and donna on the motorcycle that kind of stuff we're not gonna get to it in this show but i believe in your book he t- he'll also talk about a more detail about the uh is it is it a moose head whatever the head is that <laughs> for the bank yeah. you know you know why is it on the table there in the pilot and stuff and he goes into detail about that which is is so cool yeah, there's a yeah. There's, that's one of the set dresser stories that he had yeah. about shooting the pilot, and then the deer head that's on the deer table. Head. I believe they shot that in the school. It wasn't, but it's supposed to be the bank, right? They get the safe deposit yep. box, so yeah, they right. have a little meeting room. Craig and you asked Frank about if the show would ever come back, if they'd ever do a movie. Yeah, when we ever we talked to anyone, you know, we all knew the reality, <laughs> although maybe we didn't at the time. We didn't ever expect that there were going to be any more Twin Peaks. But we nevertheless felt like we wanted to ask the actors about, you know, what, whether they thought there would be more. Uh, maybe they had some insight we didn't know about. Again, at the time, we're very, very close to Fire Walk With Me. Fire Walk With Me had only been out a year ago. Mm. And, and there was rumor at the time that Fire Walk With Me had been designed to open up perhaps a series of films. Robert Engels had talked about, you know, they kind of seeded the story with this the backstory that maybe they were going to expand upon in in future films and so we asked frank silva about whether or not you know he thought there would be any more i think there should be some sort of closure mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know sure i mean i think it kind of i mean i guess it does kind of close it in a way you know when you look at twin peaks fire walk with me mm-hmm. but i also think that there's a lot of unanswered questions that people would like to know and maybe finally put it all to rest. Maybe he d- is planning on doing something mm-hmm. as a closure. Maybe that was an open ending mm-hmm. to like be able to do a closure on it. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know. I think it could have that third trilogy. Mm-hmm. I think it could have that closure movie, mm-hmm. you know, with the first pilot and then Twin Peaks Fire Walk With Me and then that, that final episode yeah. to end it all. And maybe he is planning on it. I mean, no one knows with David. Yeah. It's interesting to hear him mention it in terms of a trilogy. He, he kind yeah. of, it, it, his thinking is that there was the pilot, 
maybe the pilot in the series, but you know, the pilot in Fire Walk With Me and that maybe there would be a third installment. It, it's, it reminds me of, uh, we asked Mark Frost, uh, shortly after this interview, we had an opportunity to talk to Mark Frost. He said, do you think there'll ever be more Twin Peaks? And he, you know, Mark Frost like, oh, yeah, I don't know, I don't know, but never say never. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> yep. It might take 25 years, 27 years, where yeah. it'll happen again. Right. Oh, man, this is so special to be able to hear Frank Silva. I mean, like I said, it's such a rare thing to have really much of, of interviews with him or even be able to hear him. And this is like such a, a gift you're giving to the fans, John, to be able to let, share this, this archive. Thank you, John. Thank you, guys. I've got to tell you, personally, I was a little uh, hesitant. I know I talked to Ben about that. Both Craig and Frank Silva have passed away, and, and here I am kind of putting their voice back out there but both of them knew they were being recorded and both of them knew that this was you know something that was going to be shared with the public anyway uh i didn't want to overdo it i didn't want to do the whole thing but i thought yeah some of these little stories they're different to hear them than they are to read them you guys know this doing the podcast i mean we can hear the voices of the actors when you when you interview them and at the time when we were doing the magazine you know we transcribe the interviews and put them out there and to share them with the readers it's it's different when you can hear the voice of the person talking and get the inflection and get the emotion of of what it is they're talking about and this one was one of the few interviews that we were able to do with an actor or or a writer in person Um, Mm. we did a couple we did a couple we did a great one with harley payton in person where we were sitting just across you know a table from him uh, and, and in this case, we yeah, just, you know, Frank Silva was sitting on a couch and we were sitting on two big plush chairs and <laughs> there was a table with an ashtray between us and, and we were in the room with him. I thought it'd be good for people to maybe hear him yeah. talk about talk about working on Twin Peaks and embodying that character. Awesome. That's so, so cool. cool. Thank you so much yeah. for sharing. And I should maybe we should have asked you at the beginning, but like, you know, it's been almost it's almost 30 years <laughs> ago that you recorded this. And like, I believe you had it on cassette. Do you even like say, I don't even know if this is going to play? I mean. <laughs> no, exactly. That's exactly right. I, you know, I had an old uh, little handheld tape recorder, just like Cooper's, you know, yeah. <laughs> and that's what we recorded on. The, the sound quality is what it is because we were just recording on those little cassette tapes. It was only meant to transcribe, right? You, you, it wasn't even, it was never meant to, I mean, it was always meant to just listen to, transcribe and put it in wrapped in plastic. Yeah, yeah. We just we transcribed it. Once we had the transcription, we felt like, okay, now we, we've made it more permanent because who knows what will happen to those tapes that, you know, they're not the greatest ways of, of preserving information. But nevertheless, I, so I tried playing it on the old cassette player and it just came out, whoa, whoa, you know, even though I put new batteries in, yeah. I'm like, uh oh, I think I've lost it all. And I have, you know, I have, I have interviews with so many people. I have a couple of David Lynch interviews and interviews with some actors who um, who passed away, Don Davis and and Miguel Ferrer. I bought this little this little cheap junky little thing where you you plug it into your computer and it you just plays it in and and digitizes it. So um, and it worked. It, it sounded pretty good. And wow. I, I texted Ben. I was like, Ben, <laughs> guess what I'm doing? <laughs> and I so like, I I will say this too. Uh, you know, not to get too too emotional about it but i it really did stir up some weird feelings in me i thought at first i was just like oh this is great i've got it i'm sticking it and then i could hear craig and Mm -hmm. and then i'm like why do i really want to relive this thing i mean yeah other than you know i knew it was important and it was interesting but it it also was like wow it it was 30 years ago and i kind of you know live in the past yeah but um but anyway uh I wanted ultimately to preserve these interviews. And, and so I've, I've done this one. I've done a, a whole slew of them. I've tried to get them so that they won't, you know, if the tape breaks, that's it. It's gone. Right. <laughs> so, so um, I'm amazed it held up that long. I am. Yeah. <laughs> I play things in like in the spool, it'll start falling apart and it just, it's yep. a mess. <laughs> well, and this tape too, this tape was a tape that I transcribed from. So to transcribe it, back then I'd have headphones on and the audio tape and I would listen to it and I type a few words and then I go, you know, rewind it and then listen again. And right. so the tape got rewound in little portions yeah. over and over. I mean, really went through a little bit of, you know, rough and tumble. So, uh, yeah. so anyway, it, 
it still survived. That's awesome. Well, that's so cool that you could share that with us. It's really yeah, such a so special cool. thing after all these years to hear his voice and tell his stories and hear him laughing with you guys. It's something it's something really special. Uh, yeah, good. I'm, I'm glad you guys think so. And I hope everyone out there, um, you know, enjoys it. And be, John, before we let you go, I, I I feel like every time we have you on the show, I have to ask. I always you're always, you're always like, you're like, yeah, it's like I'm working on something, I'm doing something, you know, I'm, I'm writing. What what is happening with your writing? Your own personal, not Blue Rose magazine or anything else. Your own writing. What have you been up to? <laughs> not much. Uh, the reason why <laughs> is uh, the, well, okay. So uh, and I I've mentioned this on other places too. So I kind of finished writing in January. And I handed it off to Courtney Stallings to do a copy edit. And I think she's been very busy. I told her there wasn't a huge rush, but, um, but now it's starting to weigh on me a little again. I'm like, oh, I need to get moving because it's essentially done. I wrote a book on Twin Peaks The Return. And okay, you know what? I'm going to give you guys a scoop. I'm going to tell you the title. All right. Yay. Okay. The title is Ominous Whoosh, A Wandering Mind Returns to Twin Peaks. Wow, nice. I like That's it. I like it a lot. Title. Yeah, and so I've worked on the book cover. I got a cover already kind of mocked up. It definitely needs a copy edit and it probably needs another pass of polishing. It's good that I stepped away from it for a couple of months because I was too close to it. I'd read it and I didn't know what I was even reading anymore. Now I go back, I randomly pull a few pages out every once in a while and read them. I go, okay, well, that, that sounds okay. That sounds better than I remembered it. So hopefully, you know, hopefully it'll see the light of day. It'll be available for people to, to buy, um, you know, by the end of the year, if not sooner. It just depends on getting this copy edit done. And then I have some formatting to do. I have to get it formatted because I use a lot of footnotes that, that are at the bottom of the page. And But there it is, Ominous Whoosh. I love the title. <laughs> I, the title is just wonderful. It's yeah. Uh, it's, thank you for sharing the, the exclusive there. So, I mean, we thought you were working on a book. It sounds like it's, it's closed. It's getting it's coming. We, maybe 2022. This will be the year of uh, John's next book. I surely hope so. The writing is one thing, and then you move on to the next phase. You guys know this. And yeah. so now you're formatting it, you're polishing it, you're getting it copy edited. And I don't know how long that will take. I just don't know. Um, yeah. So, um, and if you're ever uh, interested in coming back on the show and doing more of these archives, if we do a, more of these things, you will have to keep updating us on the book as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I do have some other interviews. Um, you know, you and I, uh, you guys and I can talk about, you know, what might work or might not. And, and I guess we can see if people like this. I have a lot of interviews that you guys, you know, that you've got to talk to the actors Um but I've got then, a few. Uh, you said it. You said it here first. It's like you, it's not. I mean, I, I, when we were doing, when we really were doing the show, and we would get these interviews constantly. We have these interviews. It's like, yeah, that was twenty five years ago. I don't remember this. I don't remember that. It, it really is. It was constant. That thing is like you try to edit between that and say, okay, what do you remember? And yeah. you have things that really were like only a few years after the show, after the after the film. We'll, we'll, we'll talk some more. But I know I have a feeling the fans would definitely be interested in more if if you'd want to share. Yeah, 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 for sure. John, before we go, um, what's your stuff on social so people can get a hold of you? Yeah, um, basically it's it's Twitter. Uh, so you can go and find me on Twitter at Thorn Whip, T-H-O-R-N-E-W-I-P. That's where I post Twin Peaks stuff. And and I know we weren't going to mention the Blue Rose, but just, just to let you know, there is a new issue of the Blue Rose coming mm -hmm. out. It's about the 30th anniversary of Firewalk With Me and the fifth anniversary of The Return. And I think you probably talked to Scott about it, but um, I, I wrote a little thing about memories and interesting that we we're talking about memory. I wrote a thing about how we kind of misremember things about Twin Peaks and, mm -hmm. and, and, the, and the theme of memory in Twin Peaks The Return. So... Nice. Yeah, we just recently had Scott on, and he mentioned yeah. that he was co-writing an yeah, article with you. Yeah. And I yeah. think like this is the first time, and he's <laughs> been doing the Blue Rose magazine for you know years here now, and this is the first time you guys have co-written an article. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was Scott's idea. You know, he wanted to do do something about how the return may have or may not have affected television, and so we he made a, a good first pass on it and put the core in, and then I added. Really, all I did was just find some great quotes from other <laughs> for other uh, uh, TV writers and um, and kind of make the argument that 
to Twin Peaks has had an impact on creators out there. So yeah, it's pretty good. Pretty awesome. good stuff. Can't pretty wait. Good. Can't, can't wait for the. Uh, yeah. I think you buy it. There's two issues coming out for the next year, I think, and you yeah. can get them. You can buy them yep. together mm-hmm. at bluerosemag.com. Right. All right. Well, if you like this episode and you want to hear more from John Thorns from Wrapped in Plastic Archives, give us an email at twinpeaksunwrapped at gmail.com. You can follow us on Twitter at Twin Peaks Unwrap. Like us on Facebook and we're on Spotify, iTunes, everywhere at this point. And we'll be back maybe next month. Maybe. Well, the song was Heads Up. Tails up, running for your scalp web. <laughs> Nightfall, morning call, catch you in my death bag. That's it. Oh. <laughs>